Welcome to Product Momentum, a community of thought leaders and learners coming together to celebrate the product people who are shaping our way ahead. Inspired by our most pressing questions and insightful guests, we'll explore the challenges you face and offer practical, hands-on guidance your team can implement today. This is Product Momentum. Here are your hosts, Sean Flaherty and Paul Gable. Hey, folks, we have a great show for you today. Uh, it's a repeat guest, uh, Jared Spool, back from Episode 7. He's been a great friend of ITX. He spoke at our conference. Uh, we've been on the road with him, um, and it's been a delight to get to know him over the years. This most recent conversation is uh, really par for the course along that that same trend. Uh, Jared really brings a lot of uh, strategy down to practical levels. Um, and in order to explore that, I brought along a, a really qualified co-host for today, uh, my good friend, Christina Halliday, Director of UX at ITX here. She leads the design team and practice. Uh, Christina, thanks for joining us today. It's been great to have you on the show today. Hey, Paul. Thanks for letting me crash. Absolutely. <laughs> so one of the top line takeaways that I found really helpful, and Jared is is a master at this, is bringing abstract and, and strategic thinking into really practical, hands-on approaches. Yeah. Um, I, th I think the the way that he detailed out the the do nothing future versus the possible future and the way that we solve problems through outcome driven strategies, I think was a really, you know, a, a lot of that can get very heady, but he makes it very practical. But I'm curious, what were yeah. some of the top line takeaways from your perspective? Yeah, I thought that was a very simple but powerful concept, too. Um, I think for me, talking about how even in 2024, we're seeing a lot of design team still stuck in tactical mode, right? Um, and we need to really make sure that we're we're t peeking our heads up and thinking more strategically and driving some of those conversations and in, in how we think about the UX and, and measuring the UX. Yeah. Well, it was a great conversation and I'm excited to share it. So let's get after it. Hello and welcome to the show. Today, we are really excited to be joined by Jared Spool. If you know Jared, you know he needs no introduction. If you don't know Jared, a short biography is not going to do his work justice. So I encourage you to go look him up, but he is a maker of awesomeness at Center Center. He's been a great friend of ours for many years now, and we're really excited to have him back on the show, returning from guest number seven back in our very early days of the podcast and, and looking forward to jumping back in with you today, Jared. Welcome to the show. I'm really happy to be back. It, it seems like just yesterday that I was guest number seven. Indeed. Well, you know, you've been very busy in strategic UX and research as, as you have been, but a lot of your thought leadership lately has been pointing to, you know, a brighter future for strategic UX and especially sort of the role of research in that. And just to kick us off, could you elaborate on some of the key components that strategic UX is making up in the world of products and design in 2024? What do you see the lay of the land as being right now? So most UX, and by most, I mean like 99.9%, .9%, like so, you know, 999 out of a thousand organizations, if they have any UX effort at all, it's tactical UX. And by tactical UX, I mean that it's a bunch of folks who have all sorts of really great skills that can create designs and do usability tests and write fantastic content. And, and they work at a very low level in the organization. They basically work on project work to make sure the screens are clear and understandable and the flows make sense and the content that's provided is is well represented and the things are accessible and all sorts of really important stuff but there's a limit to how much that contributes and it's basically seen at the upper levels of the organization if it's seen at all it's seen as sort of the make it pretty team and their job is to is to just clean up the rough edges make it all all look really good but what happens is, is that they focus on the wrong part of the problem, right? They focus on the sort of end game where what we're trying to do is whatever it is we're going to ship, we're going to make sure we ship it well and that it's going to be a well-built thing. But what they're not focused on, which they are, which UX people have some really unique qualities to bring, is they're not focused on, are we shipping the right thing? They're not focused on this idea that in order to understand if we're shipping the right thing, first, we have to make sure we have the right problem. 
And then we have to make sure that we have the right solution to that problem. Because if we ship something that doesn't match the problem or we ship something that isn't even addressing the, the big problem, it doesn't matter how nice it is. It doesn't matter how well it's designed. It doesn't matter how accessible it is. None of that stuff matters. And so strategic UX is this, I don't know what you would call it, a movement, an approach, a change, a transformation in organizations where what we're doing is we're starting to use the things that UX people do, the resources, the skills, the talents, the capabilities, the knowledge, the experience, the expertise. We use those to actually make sure that the organization is being competitive, that the organization is actually solving big problems, that the organization is providing the best possible solutions, that they're developing the right expertise. And so that's what strategic UX is. And it's, and it's, at a much more senior level in the organization, it's, it focuses on looking at whether the organization is delivering the right things to its customers the right way. There's a couple of ways you can see it. One is, I like to tell people, is that, you know, there are two types of organizations in the world. There are those that are currently going through a transformation, and there are those that don't know that they're currently going through a transformation. and all those organizations that are going through that transformation right now, what happens is that there's a, a way that the organization sort of thinks about change, right? You think about the executives, the most senior executives, CEOs or administrators or whoever runs the organization. You think about them as people who are sort of venturing into an unknown territory. They don't really 100% know what it, what they need to know, what they need to do. And in most organizations, in 99.9% .9 of organizations, they, they look to other executives, other people at the C-suite, at the senior levels to, to make sure that they are taking the right change into account. They might work with people in the sales organization to make sure the customers are going to buy whatever the new products are or in the new regions that they're transforming into, or they work with the finance team or even the HR team. And those are all sort of strategic consultations. They're partnering with those folks and they're having these conversations about where the organization's going and why it's going there. And all of that is great. All of that is exactly what should be happening. But there's a team in the organization that's, that everyone will acknowledge is essential and important, and they, they can't do without, but they never consult with them on this stuff. And that's the custodial team, right? That's the janitors and the custodians who keep the buildings clean and make sure facilities are top-notch and, and work real hard to do this. But when the organization's going through a big transformation, they don't call up the custodians and say, hey, what do you think? Should we be going in, you know, moving into Latin America, or should we be, you know, just sticking with the regions we have? And so those folks are not, are not consulted. And, and in a strategic UX organization, the UX people would be in that first group. They'd be amongst the salespeople because they have, they have knowledge about who the users are, what the users need, what the current experiences are like, and what the future experiences could be like. But in most organizations, they're treated more like the custodial team. They're, they're, they're seen as this important function, but they just make things pretty and clean and, and, and they're not really essential from a strategic standpoint. And in the world of UX, we've been feeling this a lot lately because those are the folks who are potentially first to be laid off when reductions need to happen. Those are the folks who are not being consulted at the right time, and everything is more tactical with them. Uh, and so the work that I've been doing has been about helping UX leaders function at that strategic level, bringing out the value and the contribution, making sure that they have the right metrics, that they are thinking about the right problems, and that they're dealing with the right elements of the problems. And all of those things are are what I do. And Jared, do you attribute the being stuck in this tactical mode 
to leadership? Is that a leadership problem? Is that, you know, lack of buy-in at the highest level of UX still? Is it the UX leadership? What, what do you what are you seeing out there is, is what's the problem, the root cause? I mean, problem is probably a str- too strict a word. It's only a problem because we've sort of noticed suddenly that we have this thing that we don't know much about that we need to know a lot about. Uh, I think it's just that the field grew up being very tactical and has fallen into this. I, I think it's just an evolutionary thing. I think what happened was, was in the, in the 2000s and in the 2010s, we got this shift about being part of product, right? There was this mm-hmm. notion that uh, the experience that people had was just part of the product delivery. In some organizations, it's so tactical that UX is only thought of as as a digital experience, right? Yeah. That, you know, it starts when you fire up the app, it ends when you shut it down. Right. And uh, organizations that treat UX strategically don't put those boundaries on it. But I think because the majority of organizations are tactical, because, you know, I think it's more of, you know, it's water to fish, right? They don't know that they're swimming in this tactical ocean. That, that there's a whole nother world outside of that ocean because that from their perspective, it ends at the surface. Yeah. So it's waiting to be unlocked and maybe we need to show them the way is, is maybe something, a, a call to action for design teams. And, you know, how can they start to, to show that value? You know, and I was immediately thinking of service design, right? As you're talking about limiting impact to digital experiences, the media thing that comes to mind is how can we get teams to look bigger at the actual end-to-end experience? And I know that's a lot of what you talk about too, right? Like connecting with the customer support teams and seeing things at a bigger level. Yeah, I think I think it's, it's first, you, you have to switch from product to experience. And so service design, I see as sort of an early attempt to, to think about things that way. Uh, I think there is no real difference between service design and UX design in the bigger picture. I think, you know, there are lots of little skills. You know, when I'm when I'm designing a, a pull down, I've got all sorts of skills that I'm working on it at a very small tactical level. Yeah. But nobody says, oh, my gosh, that product changed my life. They switched to pull downs. If it was that easy. Yeah, it's 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 focusing on the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, the, that we start teams down this this direction is we focus on outcomes. Tactical folks all focus on outputs. They focus on what they deliver. Yep. Everything's about delivering something. We're either delivering wireframes or we're delivering usability results or we're delivering a service blueprint. We're delivering something. And so everybody focuses on delivery. Where as in the world of strategic work, you don't focus on delivery, you focus on outcomes. An outcome is the change in the world that happens because you've delivered something and or happens when you don't deliver something. I mean, it's a change in the yeah. world. <clears throat> so what we do with teams is we start them and we say, okay, whatever you're working on right now, let's, let's take whatever you're working on this this new feature that someone told you you had to build and you're building it. If you do a fantastic job on this feature, how will it change someone's life? Mm -hmm. And more importantly, how will it improve someone's life, right? So whose life is going to improve and how? And the thing is, is that most people can't answer that question. In fact, most UX people can't answer that question. I was talking with a team that, that, was so proud of what they knew about their customers and everything they knew. And I said, and they, they, they run an e-commerce site uh, that sells uh, IT equipment. And I said, okay, if you do a great job on this new way of selling, selling your IT equipment, basically they were working on this feature where, where you basically just as an IT manager, you described what you were trying to do, and then it would recommend the hardware that you needed and the software you needed to have to do that mm-hmm. thing. 
And I said, okay, so if you do a great job on this thing, how will it improve someone's life? And they had no answer. They, they said, well, users might, you know, save time or they might write. I'm like, no, no, no. Tell me specifically, give me the name of someone whose life you're going to improve. Hey. Yeah. And they're like, well, we don't know. I'm like, you are one of the leading retailers of this stuff. How is it you don't know the names of anybody whose life you're improving? And that's that's sort of the moment when people realize that they have been working a little too tactically. Because when you're tactical, you don't pay any attention to what's going on around you. and You don't pay any attention to things like who your users right. are or what they need. Yep. Keeping your head down, you're stuck in the sprints or whatever it is to try to try to deliver. And these seem like pretty obvious questions that we should be able to answer, right? So it's just fascinating that we're not we're not getting there, you know, especially as designers too. We're supposed to be the representing the voice of the user and thinking about these things. And somewhere along the way we we get lost, you know. Well, I think part of the problem is we have these mantras, like we're supposed to be representing the voice of the user, which I think is wrong. I think the whole organization should be the world's foremost experts in the user. If yep. someone in the organization has to represent the voice of the user, that implies that everybody else doesn't have to represent the voice of the user. I think we've lost the game going yeah. in under those contexts. I think the number one thing that a strategic UX team needs to do is make sure that the organization is the world's foremost experts on who the users are and what the users need, what their current experience is like, and what their mm -hmm. future experience could be like. Why are you allowing anybody else in the world to have more expertise on this than you? I want to dig into one thing that you've, you, you've been really helpful and broad and kind of describing this sort of sea change that's going on right now and try to make it a little bit practical for folks who are, they're in a delivery team, they're in sprint land, they're on an agile a unit of some sort or another, and they're just, you know, grinding through user stories and making mockups and wireframes and just kind of shipping and in this, in this rut. And I see so many people in this mode of just constant delivery. How can an early or, or mid-level career designer who is, you know, maybe not in a position to make decisions still have a voice of influence to bring this idea to bear on a on an organization that might just be stuck in this agile rut. What are some practical ways that people maybe not in that leadership role can still nudge the needle towards this sort of holistic service design and strategic UX mindset? Is there a way that we can shape this from the individual up or does it necessarily need to be top down? No, leadership comes bottom up. So oh, the first thing you need is the way this works is, is managers and leaders are not the same. Right? Manager is appointed by the organization. They have direct reports. Their job is to make the organization, and particularly their directs, more effective. And by that, I mean their directs need to understand what's expected of them. They need to have all the materials and resources to do their best work every day. They need to have an understanding of how what they do relates to the mission of the organization. They have to understand how their opinions count. They need to understand how all of this maps into their career, right? That's what good managers do, is they make sure all those things happen. Leaders uh, are not about making the team effective. Leaders are about pushing a vision forward. And you become a leader, not when the organization appoints you as a leader, you become a leader the moment you have a follower. And when you have a follower, that person wants to take your vision and move it forward. So you need to have a compelling vision that gets people excited. And people get wigged out about a vision. They think it's this big thing, but you can think of a vision as basically uh, a timeline. And the timeline starts with a point on it, which is today, and then it goes forward into the future because that's sort of how timelines work. And 
the thing about timelines is that there can be multiples of them. And there's one sort of default timeline, which is a timeline where today, if we just look around, we see that we have all these problems that we can easily identify that people can see. And all of these problems are here because of everything we've done up to this moment. And if we follow this timeline uh, on one path, I call the path, do nothing different. We're going to end up with a future where nothing is different. So all of those problems that exist today are still going to be here. Plus, there's probably going to be a couple more because that's how entropy works. But there's an alternative to this, right? And the alternative is is a, a different future, right? We can just put a point on the, on the timeline and say, this is a different future. We'll call it the better future. And what makes it the better future is that all of the problems that exist today, well, they've been solved. That's what makes it a better future. We can imagine this future where all of these problems have been solved. We don't know exactly how we've solved them. That's not worth getting into quite yet, because if we, if we don't get agreement that this better future is the future we want, it doesn't matter how we think we would solve them. So, so we just have to know that we want this better future. And when we talk about a vision, what a vision is, is a story that tells the difference between that better future, the future that we're going to get to if we do something different, and the future that we get to if we do nothing different. So that vision is, is just a story that tells us what the difference is between those things. And if we have a great story that tells us the difference between the future we're going to get if we do nothing different and the future that we're going to get if we do something different, people get excited about that story. And that's mm -hmm. when you get a follower, right? You see this these days often in things like people coming up with, hey, we should do a design system. And it's like, this is the future we're going to get when we don't have a design system, but we could have this better future when we do. And, and that better future will take all these problems because we don't have a design system today, and it's going to solve them in all these different ways. We won't have seven versions of the same component. We'll be able to develop faster. Developers can do their own first cut designs without the help of the very limited design team. There's all sorts of things that happen here. And then we can talk about what the difference, how we're going to get there. If but People are like, nah, we don't need a design system. It doesn't matter what our plans for how we're going to build it are. Yeah. So we focus here on, on this better future. And that's, that's the, the place you start with. And, and this is an outcome-driven approach, right? Because we're starting with, well, what's the change in the world? The change in the world is these problems are going to go away. And when those problems go away, it's going to be a different world than the one we're going to end up with if we just keep doing what we've always done. Yeah. And a key piece is obviously enrolling the entire team in this vision, right? Bringing others into the process. Is there, do you have any specific recommendations for how to create the vision and bring everyone along for the ride? Like, have you seen pitfalls and then areas where it worked really well in trying to get to this place? Sure. There, there are some common traps that, that people fall into. One trap is they start selling the do something different before they sell the future. Mm -hmm. We have to do agile. Why are we doing agile? We just have to do it, right? What problems are we solving? Don't know. This is agile is the way to go. This is what we do. And the, and the problem is, is that, is that, you know, one of the things when you become a leader, one of the things you begin to realize is that when anybody resists an idea that you have, it's because they are perceiving some sort of risk. There's some sort of risk between what you're proposing and what they've always done. 
And the do nothing different path becomes the less risky of the paths. Safe. <clears throat> it's safe. We at least know what it is. We know yeah. how it works. We know what we're going to end up with when we're done. So or at least we think we do. So this is this is the problem of of selling the method or the technique or the process, right? And this is the problem that a lot of UX people have is they're they're all process focused because tactics is all about process. So being a hundred percent process focused means that they focus on oh well we're going to do this thing and then that thing and we'll experiment in here and, details and, yeah. <laughs> pixels. And it'll be this messy thing. And, and everybody's like, why would we do that? Yeah. Right. Because we haven't sold the vision yet. So that's one trap. Another trap is that all the things I see as problems here aren't the problems you're dealing with. So when I paint my better future, you're like, okay, but that doesn't solve any of my problems. Why do I care? And so you have to do research. You have to figure out who the stakeholders are that you need to influence. And you have to make sure that those stakeholders have their problems solved too. They have to also have things in this list that belong to them. So that they are so excited, they're willing to take the risk, right? When we get people so inspired, so excited, they're, they're willing to do all sorts of incredible risky things. Mm -hmm. It's usually a factor that we haven't we haven't done a good job of, of explaining this. And again, this is outcome-based, right? We're talking about the change in the world before we're talking about the work that we do to get the change in the world. And so it's driven by the outcome. If we want it to succeed, we have to have a clear definition of what the outcome looks like, of, of how it really does make things better in people's lives. Otherwise, it's not inspire, inspirational and it's not something anybody's going to jump on. You know, life is hard enough. Why just why make things harder if there's no reward? Yes. So at the risk of being pedantic, I want to tie in the, the, the idea of outcomes and vision and problems, because I think in, in my mind, it can be easy to uh, blur those ideas together. But the problems that you're solving for do nothing versus do something. And the vision being the delta, right, between the, the two possible futures and then the outcomes being how it's felt in the world. Are they three different ideas that need to be described as different components of that overall story? Or are the problems, the outcomes and the vision all really the same thing? Is that too reductive? Is that getting too particular about the words that you're using? Or is it important to keep those things distinct in this conversation? I think they're different lenses into the same thing, right? We're looking at it from different angles. So let's talk about something specific. I've, I've got a client that I was talking to last week. They make the next generation of accounting software, whatever that might mean to you. And their clients are going to be medium and small businesses. And they think they have a real offering here. The CEO has put an objective on the table, which is by the end of 2024, they need 900 new subscribing clients for their software as a service accounting system package. And so the UX people are like, well, that, you know, I don't, what do I have to do with getting 900 new? That's a sales problem. That's not my problem. But I immediately started talking about, okay, so tell me where these 900 new clients are coming from, right? This is, a bit, this is an industry that is fairly saturated, right? Businesses today use some sort of accounting software or they are still on paper, right? It's one or the other. And if you're going to get 900 new clients, what percentage are using somebody else's accounting package? And what value do you bring in your capabilities that make this worth switching from somebody else's accounting package to use? One of the things about accounting systems is that they lock you in with the data, right? When you have years of data with an existing accounting system and you have to have seven years of data at your fingertips in case 
you get an audit coming down or you have to go back and and take a credit based on past losses or some other things. You've got all of these reasons to need to get historical data. Are you going to run two systems simultaneously? Is that what you're asking your customers to do? Or are you somehow going to import all their existing data from their existing system into your system? And then how do they run these historical reports? Have you thought anything about that that process of onboarding into this new yeah. product and getting all that historical data there? And then, or maybe you're not going after those people. Maybe you're 900 new clients are the last 900 people on the planet who are running their business without an accounting system. What have you thought about? Why haven't they adopted an accounting system, right? What is it that you're doing that nobody else has ever done that has has gotten there? And what is the experience of learning an accounting system when you've never used one before? Because if they don't have an accounting system, they don't have much of a bookkeeping system. How are you going to make this valuable to them and allow them to run their small business without interruption? Because chances are they're trying to do other things other than accounting all day long. And so what do you know about your users and your customers? And how can you guide the CEO to say 900 is an unrealistic expectation or we could do much better than 900 or we need to focus our marketing at this audience, or we need to make sure that our customer success team has these tools. I mean, what are you doing to deliver a great experience to the customer such that they are going to be excited to be your your customers, that they feel like you exceed their expectations and you've anticipated their needs instead of missing their expectations and not understanding what their needs are such that you miss them. And these are the things that the UX team needs to do right now before it does anything else. And that's how we think of it strategically. Now, what's the outcome? The outcome is each of those 900 new businesses, the people who do the accounting think that this was the best change they've ever made in their business. And the problem is, is that you've got this overly saturated market where you're trying to be something different than household brand name services. And so, you know, how are you going to be better than the zeros and my MYOBs and Intuits and Oracle Finance and SAPs of the world? That, that is such a masterclass in bringing theory into practice. It, yeah. that it was making sense in, in the abstract, in, in the way that you diagrammed out the possible futures. But as soon as you brought it into a a practical example that that case study, that little mini case study that you just walked us through was a really great application of how we can, I think, bring this into our organizations and try to find some followers at whatever level we're at. You know, I want to continue this conversation for another hour, but I'm afraid we're coming up on time. And to close this out, I just have a couple of quick questions to, I mean, I didn't set the time, you set the time. Well, (laughs) We are trying to be sensitive to our users, and part of that is is having a finite amount of time to to share conversations with us. The first kind of wrap up question is: Where can people go to find more information about this, either through work of yours or other people who you've found inspiring? What's a good place you'd point product and design professionals looking for ways to make a difference in their organizations for? So, we started a community called Leaders of Awesomeness which we started when the pandemic hit just because we didn't know what else to do. And since then, we've gotten 48,423 as of this morning UX leaders into this community. Who knew there were so many UX leaders? That's the place that I would start because we put all sorts of resources and we run programs out of there. Uh, Every week we have free recordings, uh, or not recordings. We have free sessions, live sessions that you can attend. Um, but we record them too, in case you miss them, uh, that talk about strategic UX that dive into all of the aspects of it. We've put 150 of those into the archives that are available. All that's available for free. So you can join leaders of awesomeness. And then we have training programs that we do 
on strategic UX research, on making UX and Agile work together coherently, on uh, creating metrics that really raise the value of UX throughout the organization, strategically make UX visible at, a, at, at the senior strategic levels. And so we have programs on that, on creating a, what we call an experience vision, which is a story of what the future could be for your users and your customers, say three years from now, five years from now. You know, if this, if this little financial startup wants to really succeed, they should paint a picture of how the world will be different when they're successful five years from now. And then what they're doing now are just baby steps to that. So we focus on, on the vision part. And then I coach and mentor senior leaders on a regular basis. That's, that's mostly what my day is when I'm not talking on podcasts to, you know, influential people. <laughs> I love it. Well, I, as a, as a, an attendee of the leaders in Boston, this webinar, I, I can Same. firsthand it. <laughs> yeah. It, it's been really helpful having you there. And, and you actually answered my second question already, unless there's anywhere else. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, is there any place that people can go to find out more? And it sounds like that would be a great place to start. Is there anywhere else that people might be pointed to, to find more of your work or sites or connect with you on, uh, on, well, so a lot on, on LinkedIn and medium. And we have our own website center center.com, but I think leaders of awesomeness is sort of the hub of all of that activity. Everything starts and ends there. Well, and speaking right. for, uh, Christina and myself, it's been a pleasure having you back on the show, Jared, it's always just in enlightening and, and a fresh perspective whenever I get a chance to, to hear you think. I, I appreciate it so much. Thanks for taking the time. What episode Thanks, are we up? 130 something or so, but we'll... Okay, so in, <laughs> in another 130 something episodes, I can give you an update on where, on how we are doing. Sooner. <laughs> Can't wait. All right, Jared, take That's care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Well, that's it for today. In line with our goals of transparency and listening, we really want to hear from you. Sean and I are committed to reading every piece of feedback that we get. So please leave a comment or a rating wherever you're listening to this podcast. Not only does it help us continue to improve, but it also helps the show climb up the rankings so that we can help other listeners move, touch, and inspire the world just like you're doing. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next episode. Mm -hmm.